Hey folks, Matthew Weiss here, WeissAdvice.com and Weiss Advice here on YouTube. In this video, we're going to be talking about rock vocals. If you've been watching the channel this week, we've talked about rock drums, rock bass, rock guitar. Only makes sense that we talk about rock vocals. Now, rock is a genre that's been around for 70 years. It is a very, very broad idea, so I'm going to try to give you some basic principles that are going to make sense across the board, but really this is going to be applying mostly to some hard rock kind of vocals. So let's just play this down, let's give it a listen, and then let's talk about some of the ideas. So like all things, when we're figuring out a treatment, we have to figure it out in context of everything else. So that's going to apply both to the overall genre that we're working in. It's also going to apply to the delivery of the vocal and also the arrangement. And I like this particular record for this because we have sparser parts of the song and we have denser parts of the song. And both of those are going to require different treatments. And what I will say is... While there are certainly a lot of ways to do rock, one of the ways that I find really inspiring is the Chris Lord Algae techniques that were from the 90s, which arguably defined the sound of modern rock, or at least did for a long period of time. Uh, some might say Andy Wallace, and I think a case could be made for both, but one of the things that's really interesting is that if you listen to the CLA vocal sound from that time, the vocals are actually a lot quieter than you might remember them. And the reason is basically this. If we have big bass, big drums, big guitar, big vocals, ultimately, nothing is big. Everything is just kind of medium. But if we have one thing, particularly vocals, and it's a little bit quieter, then it makes everything else seem a lot bigger because as human beings, our ears tune into the voice. That's what becomes our sort of barometer for what the level of everything is. It becomes the centerpiece naturally. So if we can get our vocal to be a little bit lower, by contrast, it makes everything else a lot bigger. Now, having a lower sound sort of makes things a little bit challenging. We need to pay attention to our upper mid range because if we're going to have something quieter, we're going to need it to cut and those upper mids are going to be what helps it cut through. The other thing we're going to need to pay a lot of attention to is going to be our compression, our dynamics, because if everything is up and down, we're going to have moments where the vocal is either too loud or just loud enough and then other moments where the vocal is too quiet or, you know, maybe just loud enough, but then the loud stuff is like shouting way over the record. So we're not going to be able to find a good vocal level. And that even applies to like inside of words and phrases. We might lose bits of the word and phrase if we're not really managing those dynamics. Another thing we will also want to pay attention to is our saturation, because saturation in audio works very similar to saturation in photo. If we have something that is heavily saturated, our eye goes to it. If we have something that is heavily saturated, our ear goes to it. So let's start with this denser section because I think a lot of these points get illustrated best here. I'm going to take off my effects and I'm going to pull the level of the vocal up a little bit and let's play it just the way it came in. So not a bad vocal by any stretch. I mean, it sounds good, but there's just that natural effect of like certain words are being heard pretty clearly. Other words feel like they're a little bit low. And if I try and push things up a little bit, then certain words are going to end up feeling a little bit loud. So my goal here is going to be to get the vocal to sit down in the mix, but still cut right through. My very first effect chain here is all about that. It's all dedicated to this idea. So I'm going to bring this on and now let's listen to it. Your 
So let's just sort of break down what's going on here. Uh, the first thing that I want to point out is the heart of this is actually this FG stress. So this is set 20 to 1. That's a pretty high ratio. It's doing anywhere from like 6 to 12 dB of gain reduction. Basically, I'm really hitting this compressor pretty hard. Uh, I also have Distortion 3 selected, so I'm getting a little bit of color from it, but I think that's less important. My attack and my release are not super fast, but they're not slow either. They're like on the fast side of medium, and that's going to just keep everything kind of controlled so all the words can be heard nice and clearly. My next two modules here are going to be getting the the parts of the vocal that we really hear, the upper mids and some of the treble, to really pop through. So the first one's pretty straightforward. I'm just pushing upper mids, and I'm pushing the upper mids into the compression. So here I've got, what, 1.6K, I'm adding about 3 dB, and also 2.6K, I'm adding also about 3 dB. So let's bring that on. Now, it does make the vocal feel a little narrower. That's okay, because we it, it's more important for it to cut than to feel full. And then lastly, this little bump here, I'm bringing up some treble. The thing is, I don't want it to sound too shiny and pop and polish. I really don't want that, so I'm also rolling off what's above 10K. So basically, I'm making my 5 to 10K brighter, but 10K is getting rolled off. So it's going to keep it feeling a little grittier, a little bit more raw sounding, and not quite so poppy sounding. So let's do a quick little before and after there. So it really makes it stand up, but at the same time, it's not too shiny. Okay, the last thing I'm doing, this is something that I think that you should try, but be prepared to not necessarily like it, because sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, and it's also kind of just like something I do. It's not necessarily as ubiquitous of an approach as what I was just talking about here. Basically, I'm using the... the uh, Slate mic emulation software that normally pairs with the microphone, except for I'm using it just on the microphone that was used on the vocalist. So it's it's coupling the sound of one microphone with the emulation sound of another, which makes for this very saturated, kind of woolly, sort of like shifted EQ kind of sound, and it can be really cool. I'm using the older model of the Classic 87 in particular because it's going to soften some of those highs that I brightened up in kind of a very, like, subtle way. And it's also going to saturate those forward mids, pull that 1.5k forward, and that's what we really want to hear in that. So I'm going to give you the before and after on that real quick. I think that makes it just feel a little bit fuller, even though we're still focusing things into that sort of narrow mid-range. It just makes it feel a little bit broader and a little bit more, well, saturated, I guess. Now, I'm going to solo the vocal real quick, and we're going to listen to it. Oh, my dear, bless your heart. You're not as pretty as you thought. So a couple of things immediately come to mind. First of all, in solo right now, especially when we get to the back half of this, the vocal sounds over compressed. It did not feel that way when I heard it in the context of the mix. It's also very mid rangey and it's also slightly oversaturated sounding. None of these things matter in solo. I cannot stress this enough. If it sounds good in solo, it probably will not sound right when it's meshed with these extremely heavy, bright, energetic, distorted guitars. It's just not going to work. It is not going to sound rock if it sounds too natural, I think. So let's do a little cleanup. We can hear that there's this sort of very bright, harsh sound in the upper mids. Oh, my dear, bless your heart. Especially on my dear, we hear it pretty clearly. My dear, my dear. Yeah. Okay, let's cool that off. My dear, my dear. Still a little bit of it, but I think it's going to be okay in the mix. Basically, it's around 3K. I'm cutting out about 10 dB, and that's just kind of bringing that resonance down a little bit. There's also another one a little bit above that. I'm using a dynamic EQ to chill that one out here, and that's at 4K. Oh, my dear. So it's a little smoother this way. Let's uh, bypass them. Oh, my dear. 
bring them back in. Oh, my dear. So just calming those resonances down, and then lastly, a de So now let's hear all of that in the context. Oh, my dear. So I give that like a seven out of 10 right now. I think it works. I think if it went out this way, I think it would be okay, but I don't think it's amazing. I don't think that it's really like, you know, winning the hearts and minds of the youth here. So something I like to do in rock records, I like to have two parallel chains set up on vocals, just ready to go. And one is going to be a distortion chain. The other one is going to be a compression chain. The distortion chain, I think, is the interesting one. Basically, what I do is I listen to the sound of the guitars. I match the idea of the distortion. I don't try to like not, like completely match the distortion. I don't think that's realistic. But I like to match the idea of it. And then I like to bring that up in a parallel distortion channel. And basically, this is kind of like my indulgence channel. It's if I were to have a really heavily distorted, crazy sound that was just like super indulgent, what would work with the record? So I'm going to play what that would sound like here. So it's like soft fuzz going into a hard fuzz sound. Uh, this is my preset, my rock fuzz fucker preset here. So basically what it's doing is it's leaning it toward the lower end and then that we hit this two-stage distortion. One is kind of a softer clipper and then it's followed by a much harder clipper. And that to me is kind of the sound of the guitar. It might be actually the other way around. I think the guitars are actually doing a harder clipper followed by soft clipping at the amp. Uh, or maybe it's hard clipping of the amp because it is pretty high gain, but it's basically a combination of clipping going together, and that's kind of doing the same thing here, and then it's a little bit of EQ that kind of moves it into the mid-range, so that's what we're hearing with that. Now, the problem with doing this is that sometimes having this kind of like really heavy-handed distortion as a vocal effect can work, and I don't think we're far off here. However, sometimes when you go overindulgent, it sounds more like something that's put on, like it's being done to sound cool, rather than it actually sounding like authentic distortion energy that comes from the emotion of the performance, and it can sound a little cheap. Now, I think this one's borderline. I'm going to play it again. Yeah, it sounds cool, but at the same time, it sounds a little forced. So, that's okay. This is why it's a parallel channel. Basically, if it sounds cool, that's the only part that we want. Because what we're going to do is we're going to blend it in with our main vocal. And when we hear the main vocal with it, it ends up sounding like this. Oh, that's beautiful. I love distortion. Uh, basically, we end up getting this, what almost sounds like like this kind of like blues breakup in a way, but it's it sounds like if you know the sound of distortion, you know it's distorted. I think even the average listener would be like, oh, it's pretty fuzzy and distorted, but it doesn't sound like it's being done in a way that's like false or fake. It feels like it's coming from a real place, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, this is a preset of mine, and if you are a Weiss Advice member, all of my Isotope Trash 2 presets are for download in the download section, so check it out. Uh, there's a bunch of 808 ones and, and other really cool effects because I love Isotope Trash and it's too long to set it up manually every single time I use it. So <laughs> I have my own a uh, bunch of my own presets. The other thing I've got going on here is a parallel chain. This is just the CLA-76. Uh, this has been like my parallel compression kind of go-to for like... I don't know, 15 years or something. It just seems to keep working, so I have it going on. What's important is that I'm doing volume rides on it, so it's very, very low in this first verse, and it comes up a lot more in the second verse. Basically, I use the parallel compression to help with dense arrangements. As the... As the guitars start coming up, as the cymbals start hitting heavier, that's when I can push in more parallel compression to just help keep up with what's going on here. So, if we pop on over to the second verse here's without it so 
back to the first verse, you'll hear that there's we don't have that fuzz guitar that's going the whole time. We get that big open space, especially on the second line. We don't have that in the second verse. So I'm just going to bring up a little bit of that parallel compression. The basic formula is fast attack, fast release, and then you can use 4 to 1, 8 to 1, 12 to 1. It just depends on the color that you're trying to get from it, but 4 to 1 works here. Vocal cuts right through. No problem at all. And we're also like 20 dB under the vocal. Uh, maybe 22 dB under the vocal, so we're not even using that much of it. A little goes a long way. All right, let's talk about the ambience, because reverb in rock is a really interesting idea. Uh, for harder rock genres, I'm a little bit reverb squeamish. I like delays, and I don't mind reverbs when they are not pretty reverbs. So here, Phil provided a spring reverb. Uh, I'm in the wrong section. Hold on. A spring reverb. And it's a mono spring reverb at that. I dig that for this sound. I think that's a good way to add a little bit of dimension to the vocal and a little bit of size to the vocal without it sounding like there's this like really pretty lush kind of reverb coloring things up that would not make sense for the record. In general, I tend to lean a little bit more heavily on delays for this kind of stuff. There is a little bit of a stadium feel to it. Uh, we have a delay provided again. The key here is that delay is not a pretty one. Again, it's really broken up. It's very mid-pushed. Oh, it's kind of doing what the vocal was doing through the isotope fuzz, right? It, that is also another good way to get attitude into a vocal without it feeling forced. You can distort the crud out of your delay or your reverb, and that's going to put all of that texture and grit in there without having to like force it onto a vocal and make the vocal sound unnatural. So those reverbs I think are really working. I'll just bypass them real quick. Oh my do want to point out it still sounds good dry and that's really important the more kind of punk raw kind of sound that we want i think the drier we can go and the better it gets this is kind of in between two worlds when it comes to that it's like it's got some punk influence to it but it's really more of like stadium hard rock kind of stuff so a little bit of reverb i think is better But notice that it's not like caked in reverb and the reverb itself is not like suddenly making it feel a lot more lush. Now, let's compare that with the earlier section. This is almost like a completely different song right here. The arrangement is super different. It's way more open. The drums are being played very quietly. And then the vocalist here is delivering kind of softly. It's sort of like he's telling a secret. And so for this, I'm using a much prettier reverb. It's going to fill up some more of that space. It's going to kind of contrast the two vocals. It's going to create that sort of gentler, prettier idea that's happening with this vocal. So I'll turn that reverb up right now. So that's a convolution of a Bricasti M7. There's a preset in there called Concert Wave that always makes me feel like like a wave of reverb in this like big open stadium kind of space. That's what I get from it. So I felt like that would be a good one to start with first and try. So I slapped it on there and boom, just worked instantly. Didn't feel like I needed to tweak anything, actually. Just sounded great, which is always nice. Uh, the processing here on these vocals is a little different. So I'm not using the FG stress on these vocals because I'm not going for that hyper compressed feel anymore. We've got a more open sounding arrangement. So instead I'm using the custom opto and I'm doing it in a much gentler way. And then I'm pairing that with this Neve 
style EQ and I'm not pushing quite as much in that like 1.5 range. What I'm really doing is I'm enhancing some of the top and some of the upper upper mid like 3k where it's a little shinier and I'm pulling out a little bit of the lows. So I'm going to take these effects off real quick. I'm not too sure about the Lately, I've noticed that there's a little stylistic trend of having vocals have that really husky low mid, but I think for this style of record, it's just way off base. So I'm cutting that down, I'm, I'm pushing up some upper mid, and we end up with this. Now, I'm also using that same fuzz, though, because that's going to help connect it sonically throughout everything else. Because of the way he's singing, it interacts pretty differently, but it's still really cool. So it's really only on certain words where we actually hear that fuzz and breakup, but we do get a little bit of it, and I think that that's kind of a nice touch. So different approach to different vocal areas. Now the last thing that I want to say is that we want to make sure that we're going through the entire song and managing the moments. This is super, super important, and I feel like this is the thing that separates good from great. It's going through and making sure that everything is working for the section that we're in. So for example, I don't have too many delay and reverb throws, but just when we get to the end of this section, I have this really cool delay throw that makes a lot of like, it just gives that energy where transitional energy is needed. It almost feels like a third vocal doing like a scream ad lib in the background. That's kind of the idea behind it. Uh, this is coming off of a preset here, basically from Guitar Rig. I really, really like Guitar Rig for like very stylized delay throws here. It's this shimmer delay thing, but it's been modified a little bit so that it's a little less shimmery and a little bit more screamy, so to speak. And then we also have some automation going on with some EQ because as the vocalist changes his vocal style, here we're really soft and gentle. But here, when we come back around, it's not the same delivery style. There's a lot more mid-range energy, and it's a lot more pinched, so there's some crazy resonances showing up, and also his vocal thins out. So I'm thickening up his voice with a mid-range bump that's automated to only come on where he starts going into this more screamy style, and then also cutting some mid-range resonances with an EQ that's, again, only automated to come in where he switches his screamy style. So pulling up parallel compression where the arrangement gets denser, changing the EQ on the vocals where the style of singing changes, managing certain reverb and delay throws. Uh, I've got rides on the delay here toward the end of the verse, kind of building up a little bit of tension and some like almost acting like a riser going from the verse into the pre-chorus section. That kind of stuff, I feel like you really need the vocal to tell the story completely, and as much as the musicians are going to perform it and the vocalists are going to perform it, some of that's going to need to be managed on the back end during the mix as well. All right, guys, I hope you dig this video. If you do, hit that like button. If you want to catch more videos like this, hit subscribe with the bell notification. We've got just a little bit of time left. If you sign up for the Weiss Advice newsletter, you can still get the low-end guide for free. However, January 1st, 2023, that is no longer available, so the clock is ticking on that. Lastly, you know what we say here at Weiss Advice. We are musicians, sound is our instrument, and I will catch you next time.